Coming up on this week's episode of Check Your Balances, we celebrate a baseball player that turned a $5.9 million payout into more than $35 million. Stick around for that story coming up next. Check Your Balances is a show produced and owned by Craftwork Capital. The views expressed by the hosts and their guests are personal opinions and should not be considered personal financial advice or the opinion of Craftwork Capital. All investments have risk and may lose money. Consult with your financial advisor, tax preparer, or attorney prior to implementing anything discussed. And please do not use this show as the sole basis for financial decisions. Welcome back to another week of Check Your Balances. I am Ross Anderson, joined as always by my friend and co-host, Dan Maseka. We're both in collared shirts today. Look at us, Dan. We're, we we actually are professionals. I know. We had busy days today. I don't know if you had video meetings, but I did. Although people don't really care if I'm dressed up for those, apparently. I mean, if they've seen our show on YouTube, they know that we're normally dressed like we're going to a ball game, which <laughs> something you've actually done recently. You just talked about that. You went to an O's game, I think. I did. Which is a great ballpark. The, the Nats, which I, I grew up an Orioles fan but I've never really been much of a baseball guy, but we didn't even have a DC team at the time. Now we have the nationals and I kind of switched allegiances pretty quickly. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I was never a baseball fan and then the Nats came to town and I kind of adopted that as my first baseball team. Now I live closer to Baltimore and I have a Nats world series in the rear view and the O's are now doing well. So I've conveniently swapped to the Baltimore team. Wagon jumped is basically what's happened. That's right. You know what? I, I've suffered long in all my other sports, so I'm happy to follow winners in baseball at least. I'm going to put a plug in for Camden Yards, which does have a great fan experience. And I love the experience outside of the stadium too, where I had my first hamburger in like many months and outside stadium hamburgers and Camden Yards are great. I'm going yeah. to do that again soon, game or not. Well, that's awesome. What we're talking about today is baseball or in particular, a baseball player. So every year that we have done this show, I have wanted to talk about this particular topic. And every year we forget until after it happens. It normally pops up on like my news feed on the day. Last year, I was so frustrated that we missed it again. Because I, I don't know. We could obviously record the show after the fact. That just felt silly to me. I wanted to be ahead of it. That I put on our calendars for this week that we are recording record a show about Bobby Bonilla. That is the yeah. most prep work we have ever done for this podcast, or at least the most thinking ahead we've ever done. We even telegraphed it last week. We knew a whole week ago that we were going to record this episode, which I would dare say is never true unless we have a guest. That's fairly accurate. We normally have several ideas rattling around, and then we scrap all the ideas and just record whatever we're actually thinking about in that day, which is why last week's show was just us complaining about stuff that was going on. That being said, we have prepped for this at least a little bit. Tiny bit. Tiny bit. We've got a little bit of prep. But I love this story so much for so many reasons. I think there's lessons we can take from it as investors. I think there's lessons we can take from it as just in expectation setting and, and as advisors, I think there's a lot that we can pull apart. So today we are talking about the one, the only Bobby Bonilla. And the crux of the story, if you are unfamiliar with this, you may already know, and don't worry, you don't have to know anything about baseball. I certainly don't. Bobby Bonilla had a great career. He started with the Pirates, I believe, went through, played for the Mets, got traded around a little bit. And just a, a fabulous baseball player, had a few disappointing seasons along the way. And in 1999, he had made a trip back to the, the Mets. They owed him quite a bit of money. They owed him, I think it was top dollar for baseball players at the time, which was a single year number of $5.9 million. In the context of contracts today, maybe doesn't sound like that much relative to what pro athletes are getting. But $5.9 million, quite a bit of money in 1999. Either Bobby or his agent approached the Mets and said, hey, listen, instead of giving me this $6 bucks this year, why don't we structure a deferred payment? You don't have to start paying me until 2011, 10 years down the road. And then instead of paying me $6 million, you're just going to pay me a little over a million a year 
1.19 specifically every year for 25 years. So until 2035. And every year on July 1st, the Mets have to make that payment to Bobby Bonilla because they agreed to it. And that's now what they pay. A total of $35 million essentially is being paid out to Bobby Bonilla over this long-term deferred compensation agreement that he arranged with the Mets from 1999. There's a lot to unpack there, Dan. What do you think about immediately when it comes to this story? My mind went immediately to like what, who, who wins that arrangement? Like what is the implied rate on that arrangement? And would I accept a deal like that now beyond time value of money? Cause I think ultimately this is just time value of money and gives us an opportunity to nerd out on that. There are like baseball reasons for this deal too. It frees up cap space for the Mets. They could sign more players without getting dinged. Like that goes into it too. And I'm sure if they're looking at a player who is more of a liability than an asset, they'd rather have the money. Like, let's put that aside. We understand that that's true as well. The first thing I did was, what is my implied rate for taking this contract going all the way back to 99? You know, there are a bunch of years of zeros and then you start a high payout. The number I got was something close to 8% was like the break even on this thing. So that's a pretty lofty rate for the, the Mets to guarantee, basically. And probably a fairly attractive guarantee for Bobby Bonilla, although it's definitely delayed gratification if you're getting that money. Okay. So here's the detail of this story that I love. Oh, yeah. I I actually didn't know this until you told it to me, by the way. Okay. So I I think there's two elements to this that make it really fascinating because you have to put yourself into the headspace of the Mets ownership, which at the time was Fred Wilpon. So... One is, well, what have you been making on your money? And then how have you been making it? So let's eliminate what really actually was happening for just a second and think about a plain, vanilla, boring S&P 500 return. So in 1999, where the S&P 500 over the last decade, I'm looking at a chart, it's tough to see the exact point, on, on this, but it looks like it was making in the range of 17% a year over the prior 10 years. Wild. 17%. This is the the internet boom. This is dot com. Stock prices are going through the roof. Now we know in the lens of history that that bubble was about to burst, but you're sitting there on this day watching every dollar that you don't spend go up by not like even a little bit into double digits, but by massive double digit increments on an annual basis. Like that is a really interesting context, right? So if we, if we zoom out and I'll just remind everybody of the rule of 72, which is my easiest math shortcut, the rule of 72, whatever your return rate, if you divide it into 72, that's how long it takes the money to double in years. So if you're, making 17% a year, your assumption is that you double your money every 4.24 years. That's what, if you think this is the party that's going to continue, that's the party you think you're at, is my $5.9 million, if I don't give it to Bobby Bonilla, I could have $12 million or close to it in four years, under five years, I think I could have $12 million. That's the environment that we're talking about making this investment in. Yeah. I mean, and in 1999, it felt like the party was going to go on forever, right? The, the shoe hadn't dropped yet. The other factor is that I think Fred Wilpon thought he was doing even better than that. I think Fred Wilpon thought that S&P 500 stuff is for the lame stream chumps because who I'm invested with is the smartest finance guy on the planet. And my returns are blistering hot because Fred Wilpon was invested with Bernie Madoff. Yes. That's a lot. There's a lot to unpack there. So the money that he was going to pay Bobby Bonilla, I think he thinks he's making well into double digits on. And that by the time he's going to have to pay out this 
future $35 million, he's like, this will be worth a hundred million. Who cares about 35 given the rates of return that I can get? Cause I've got this guy that can beat the system on my side. I it's, it's tough to put yourself in that mindset because we know how badly it went. Not only was the next decade in stocks, the only losing 10 year period that the modern S and P 500 has had, I believe. So we had a, we had a decade long. So from, from 1999 to 2009, you would have lost money in the S and P 500. Not great. Certainly not the 17% annualized that you're hoping for. And then in addition to that, the money that you thought you were setting aside for this brilliant tactical choice, turns out it's a scam. Your money's gone. Sorry. See you next time around. Yeah, that's the the unfortunate second half of the story that's not often told when people are toting Bobby Bonilla Day on July 1st. Yeah, it's... uh. What, what, what are your takeaways, I guess? Like when you think about that, what do you think we learn from it? So I put myself in the position of Bobby Vanilla. I, I'm thinking if I'm Bobby Vanilla presented with that deal, am I excited? I think it's very interesting to think in that context because, right, it's, I feel like it's emblematic of a lot of choices that people have, even if not at the same scale. It's like the same decision making of, do I want money today or later? Am I willing to delay gratification? And very forward looking of him, by the way, not the only team that's paying him deferred contracts. The Baltimore Orioles are also paying Bobby Bonilla for a while. Uh, I think it's like a half a million a year from the Orioles. That doesn't get talked about. No, not at all. Not too shabby for him. Like, I think it's really interesting to exchange that, that trade off of money today versus like a 25 year annuity at very attractive guaranteed rates for him. I mean, you know. we're, we're talking about a guy that has not played baseball since 2001 is receiving $1.7 million a year from the sport of professional baseball. That's a, that's a gorgeous thing for him. Now I'm curious if that deal was initiated by the Mets saying, listen, we owe you this money. We want to defer it. Or was that Bobby Bonilla's agent? And maybe that's reported somewhere and we just didn't find it when we were researching this. But uh, I'm really curious who in- instigated that. Because as a player, I think at the, certainly if you're at the end of your career, and Bobby Bonilla started playing in, I think, 1986, that you're starting to look at it going, yeah, I've been a pro ball player. He's probably made a bunch of money at that point, And he's probably asking himself questions about what's after baseball whether that's financially or, or just in terms of how he spends his time. And this could be an easy way to protect the money side of that equation. It still doesn't fix the what do you do, but it does fix the how are you going to afford to do it, at least for quite a while, if you're starting to worry about where is my money going to come from. Yeah, definitely. I think it's really interesting because it, it is easy if you've made a boatload of money already. Like He was a very highly paid athlete. To not care about stuff like this and just say, no, just give me the money. I'll, I'll deal with it. My guess is his agent orchestrated something like this and was very forward looking because like he doesn't have to worry now. Like money's coming in. Like he's laughing all day that he's getting paid. It's a national joke as we talk about it, like not at his expense. It's in his favor, clearly. And athletes are notorious for being preyed on and coerced to make poor financial decisions or making poor decisions of their own volition. And that risk has been mitigated to a large extent because he doesn't have all of it to have wasted. It's coming in predictably and on as close to guaranteed as it can be because you're basically backed by multi-billion dollar organizations. I think about it from an investing sense. And this is, it's going to sound like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth here, but we are staunch advocates of not being market timers. Right, we, we don't believe that anybody can accurately decide when to be in and when to be out of the market. That doesn't mean that we don't all have a spidey sense of whether the market is in an overbought or oversold territory, meaning what's the predominant feeling in the market right now? Is it fear or is it greed? I think that's a really interesting... 
right? Like that doesn't mean that you act on the decision. You might have to force yourself to stay disciplined and stay invested when things feel like they're a little bit too frothy. You may have to force yourself not to be ultra pessimistic when things are a little bit negative. But I tend to really like a couple metrics. I like the Schiller Cape, which is the cyclically adjusted PE, which has looked elevated for quite a while. It's, it's pretty, pretty elevated right now. And I like looking at what did the last 10 years of returns net us? Because if we compare those against historical averages, if we know that the stock market is typically going to give us 8 to 10% returns, in my mind, we should use what was the last 10 years to be forward-looking. If we were well above 10% returns, if we've been at 12, 13, 14% returns, which is what a lot of the post-2009 stock market has looked like. I believe that the S&P's average has been in the you know 12 to 14% range. Then we should expect forward-looking returns to be a little bit more modest, not forever, but maybe over the coming 10 to 15 years. I bake that sort of assumption into my planning work. To me, when I'm building models for people, that's an important thing to know. Vice versa, if we're in a situation where the stock market has been really ugly and has a past 10-year return of, let's call it zero to five, if we're looking at a period that's been really rough on, on the stock market, then I think we should be more optimistic about future-looking returns and expect that there's some sort of return to the mean. That doesn't always mean that that's what, exactly what's going to happen. There's different economic conditions. There's different levels of where the risk-free rate is and then ultimately what stocks are going to do as a result, which is all kind of how this stuff gets baked in, which is interest rate sensitive and everything else. But you can ignore that, right? You can, you can throw all of the other data in this out and say, have returns been way better than average in recent history? And should that be my expectation? Because if they've been way better than average, I would argue that we should just be more modest, not out of the market, but more modest with our expectations. And certainly don't bake your forward-looking predictions into repeating the last great 10 years. That's not a healthy way to make your projections. I think if, if, if the money were invested in the S&P 500 to this point, I think he would have still made out like I don't think it's a stupid investment. I think the market has performed like would all right, knowing knowing that the next 25 years went as they did. We have the benefit of hindsight in our, in our rearview mirror. Would you have taken that deal or would you have taken the money? I mean with the hindsight it I'm I'm going to try and assume that I I couldn't have known exactly when the stock market was going to drop, right? Because in sure. hindsight, what you would have done is you take the money up front if you're Bobby Bonilla, you hold and it you wait. for two years, right? You, you dollar cost average over you know 2000, 2001, 2002, and and then you ride ride the wave, right? Which is still going to send you through some ugly periods of time, but would not have necessarily been bad. Right, because all 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 the money lost in the '08 crash has been made back and and right. multiplied if you stayed in. So I think the math can tell you, looking historically at that, that it might have made more sense to take the money. But and and we talked about this because we did an episode a long time ago about the lottery. That like the math basically says you should take the, the flat payout because mm -hmm. you're going to make way more, especially if you're young and you can invest the money. But there is a behavioral element to this of hedging your own behavior. Like if you could promise me 25 years of a million a year, I'd, I'd be awfully interested. I'm, I'm at least taking your phone call if, if that's the deal you've got to make. And yeah, if, if you're going to say $35 million rather than six is what I'm going to make, I would be interested in that. But it would be dependent on me having my cash flow set up in a way where I, I felt like the next 10 years were secure. And I think that's probably where Bobby was. And you've seen other athletes structure deals like this more recently. Again, we were talking about Nats and O's. Steven Strasburg had a deferred contract that I thought was very interesting for a young guy to take. Like, I think this has become popular. And I think in part it is for that reason. It's like, let's, 
eliminate the biggest risk that we see with athletes. And that's decision-making risk when you're young and dumb, presumably, and get a cash flow going that could continue past your prime years as an athlete and create some stability for you. Like, let's smooth that out, which is as planners, I think what we're often doing is let's try to smooth this out. Like you're not going to know the perfect plan, but we could try to even it out for you throughout the years, whether that be cash flow or tax liability or anything on that end. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine like Steve Cohen bought the Nats or excuse me, the Mets, not the Nats, the Mets in 2020. Like he was taking on 15 years of this contract to Bobby Bonilla at the time that he bought the team. Like that, that's a wild thing that has to be factored into. I'm sure a very complex deal in terms of the true, the true valuation of what are the real liabilities of this team and, and this ownership structure, Steve Cohen's going to be good for it. You know, the, he, for he's sure. not going to have a problem coming up with that money, but Holy cow to just think about how, how the knock on effects of a deal like that really end up playing out. I, I think is fascinating. It is funny. Cause I wonder if they do like at the scale like that, it can go one of two ways. Either someone's doing a really sophisticated valuation in which case I'd imagine that is a line item. Like there's no question an important liability. Or it's in a stratosphere that's like almost so incomprehensible with very few comps that you're not really valuing it in that way. And you're like, you know, what's the difference between $2 billion or 1.7 or 2.5? Like it is what it is. We're in this ballpark. Just take it. Yeah, I, I, I bet it's in there because even if he overpaid for what the true operational value, because I tend to think sp- pro sports teams are normally purchased as a bit of a vanity project for sure. Right? Like to me, they always look like I've made so much money doing something else that this is what I'm going to do with my time now. And by the way, I say that in a place of true gratitude to Josh Harris for buying the Washington commanders. <laughs> right. I'm so happy to have Dan Snyder out of our pro sports world. So it's not, without impact, especially to the people that are fans and root for the team, a bad owner can be a toxic, toxic, like awful situation for a sports franchise. And I think we just lived through being fans of one of the worst owners in all of professional sports, but that's where we got. And the Harris group seems to be doing a much more thoughtful job. We don't know yet in terms of the product on the field, but they seem to be making a lot of the right moves. I, I think just a reminder on when you look at the Madoff scandal, what could have protected people, which is an independent custodian. Like that's how yeah. our firm is set up. When we manage money for folks, it is not through the Ross and Dan brokerage company. We don't have somebody that creates statements or tells you what your stuff is worth. It's with large giant institutions that people are familiar with. And they are the independent holders of the money. That structure is just uh, like, I I love that structure. I I really do. I think that is the most transparent way to do it is a separation of the advisor giving the advice, a third party arm's length from the advisor, and then the client themselves. It keeps it all hopefully as clean as possible. Um, Obviously, we're biased because that is our structure. That's what we chose to do. But we did choose it for that reason. It was with that in mind. Yeah. And I think the Madoff scandal was so wide reaching and well reported that it did instill some fear that like anyone is subject to what happened there. And while there are companies that do like self custody and self report, like that does happen. But for most people, when you're investing, you know, that is less of a risk than it seems. Not to undersell risk. Yeah, I I agree. Yeah, I think for me, it's just a lesson that expectations are so important, right? I I quoted this line out of Morgan Housel's book when we were talking to Brian Feraldi. I'll say it again, which is that you want to basically save like a pessimist while still having an optimistic perspective. You cannot be an investor without some level of optimism baked in, even if it's got a healthy sprinkle of... I don't know. On top of it, like you can't, you shouldn't be in the stock market if you are not ultimately optimistic either about the economy overall 
or our ability to solve problems. You have to be at least optimistic about one of those things. You can think it'll be bad, but we'll figure it out. That's fine. That is an okay perspective to invest. You can also think these people are dumb, but the economy here is so great and will be great forever. And so I'm going to remain invested. But some combination of those ideas I think is required to be an equity investor because otherwise you shouldn't be in it. It doesn't align with your views if you don't believe one of those things. Right. I mean, stocks have value because there is positive future expectations. If, if that were untrue, there would be no value in stocks. Like literally, you have to believe that's, that there is growth in the future if you're going to invest in anything. Otherwise, hoard. Yeah. I don't know. They would only be worth their book value. That's it. Right. Right. That, that, the, the value of their assets that they could sell for today. And oh, by the way, if everybody had to sell for their book value assets, it would deplete them because it would flood the market with whatever they're trying to sell. Right. And that that's assuming that they're not a business burning, right? Like if, if you think that they're going downhill, they're going to burn through all their assets on the way as well. I'm, I'm fascinated by this story. I think it, I think the Bernie Madoff twist is what makes it the most interesting to me. But, uh, as you're listening to this show, I guess this is going to come out just before, but July 1st, Bobby Bonilla day, congrats to him for, for, for getting that done. And well done. for ultimately making, I, I think, a pretty good deal. I, I, good. Think he, I think he made a great deal. Good financial decisions from Bobby Bonilla. Yeah. Good, good delaying of gratification. Yeah. All, all, all of it, good show. That's what we had for you today. I, I hope you were as entertained by it as we were excited to produce this one. We, we were really excited to share this. I think it's a fascinating story. Um, if you've got different takeaways, we'd love to hear what you think. Check your balances at outlook.com is the email address for our show. If you're going to a game, send us a picture. You at the ballpark, we'll be happy to repost it on our Instagram, which is at check your balances on Instagram. We love hearing from you guys. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you all next week. <laughs>